on this episode of Inside KU, a potentially life-changing discovery KU helps schools all over the state form strategies to stop bullying, and the university receives a special grant to help soldiers serve more successfully overseas. All that and more in this edition of Inside KU. Welcome to Inside KU, an in-depth look at some of the unique experiences at the University of Kansas. I'm Jeannie Hodes. You don't have to be on campus to see some of the innovative ways students are learning at KU. I'm at the U.S. Army base in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where KU professors are helping officers better adapt to serving overseas. The present. Et ce matin. KU professor Brian Moots doesn't mind driving an hour from Lawrence to teach a French class at Fort Leavenworth once a week. It sounded really good to me. It's nice to be back around the military soldiers and teaching French too. Having served in the Army, Moots is a perfect fit for KU's new designation and grant as a U.S. Department of Defense Language Training Center. Only nine universities nationwide hold that title. The world is so small now and soldiers are everywhere in the world need those languages to communicate in other countries. Many officers at the Fort Leavenworth Command General Staff College are required to speak a second language and maintain that skill. Vous mangez à la maison? D'accord. The new four-year grant allows KU to now teach on base rather than having officers drive to campus. Captain Ben Katzenberger says that is a huge help in his busy schedule. I think it's valuable that it's here because we have many different requirements pulling us in different directions while we're here. We have our academic requirements, you know, we have family requirements, you know, and career requirements. And so eliminating that commute and that drive allows us to focus more on the actual learning and education and not on commuting back and forth. KU professors will now teach four languages at Fort Leavenworth, including French, Korean, Russian, and Arabic, and five languages at the Marine base in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. <laughs> KU offers approximately 40 different languages, so we've got a, quite a depth and breadth of expertise. What this allows us to do is to apply it in a, a non-standard format. It doesn't have to fit the schedule of the college, and we can do individualized training. KU has already been training officers for almost 50 years. The new grant will expand on that connecting the university with more bases and exploring more innovative teaching techniques, like having a native speaker in class while a professor teaches over the internet. We're looking at, at perhaps expanding that so that uh, graduate teaching assistants and others can interact with the students on a one-on-one -on -one individual basis that fits their, their busy lifestyle. Because, you know, soldiers, sailors, Air Force Marines, they all have a, a mission, and it's mission first. Yet strong language skills can play a huge part in that mission's success. When you're speaking to people, if you're in another country, they respect you a lot more and help you a lot more if you're speaking their language. You show that you care enough about them and their culture to try and learn a little bit about them, and a little bit of how they speak and understand each other. So, yeah, it goes a long way in building that trust. Having KU's expertise on hand will also allow the military to better adapt language choices as new issues pop up on the world stage. KU in the classroom, you can begin to focus more on grammar or testing, and here you need real world situations, and they really need to know and practice and be able to communicate because it might be critical for them in the future. Captain Katzenberger's French is coming along very nicely. Je m'appelle Ben. Uh, je suis un captain dans les affaires civiles dans l'armée américaine. It's improving my confidence in knowing that I have that initial ability to break down barriers and to meet people. A confidence KU professors are looking forward to helping build upon, one word at a time. I am glad to be here and working with these guys. They're very intelligent, very motivated students that I don't know, they, they pick it up really fast, and that's very rewarding as a teacher. Coming up next, we'll hear more about KU's connection to the military beyond language training. Welcome back to Inside KU. Before the break, we told you how KU recently received a grant to help the U.S. military with language training, but that's only one of several programs aimed at current service members and veterans. I'm here with Mike Denning, who's the director at KU of the Graduate Military Programs. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Let's start off first, what is the mission of the military graduate programs? Okay, so graduate military program serves as KU's outreach to the military and we try to find uh, specific requirements that the, that the military may have, the armed forces may have for uh, education but also for research and we look for uh, what those requirements are, what KU strengths are and we try to look for a collaboration between the two. For example, KU has five international resource centers. Um, the military has education requirements within the geographical combatant commands and so we look for ways to make those two uh, come together. That sounds pretty unique. Is this something that other colleges and universities might have on their campuses as well? Really very few, and this is uh, symbolic of KU's uh, value that they have with the armed forces. And it, it really is it's a strategic investment. It's a financial investment. We've had a, a strategic relationship within, uh, with CGSC at Fort Leavenworth you know, for uh, you know, several years. But it's not just uh, CGSC. We, we attract uh, uh, Armed Force officers from across America. They could select any school that they wanted to, but they come to KU and they come obviously because of the value of our education, but also because of the, the fantastic culture that we have both for the uh, military and for the veterans. You mentioned veterans. Um, is this a focus area for KU as well? It, it, it is, very much so. For the past uh, four years, we've, we've had increasing numbers of veterans that have, uh, uh, that have been on campus. We've got a fantastic Collegiate Veterans Association, a Student Veterans Association just for veterans. We've got a uh, Veterans Alumni Chapter. We have been on uh, the uh, Best for Vets and, and military, Best for Military uh, for the last five years, just about on every uh, national scale. A matter of fact, uh, just this last year, we were number 15 uh, on the U.S. News and World Report's best, best school for a uh, veteran. Wow. Um, and also, KU recently awarded three new Wounded Warrior Scholarships. Tell me a little bit about those. Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, the Wounded Warrior Scholarship, we, we started a program with the uh, Army, uh, an Army's Wounded Warrior Education Initiative, and that started in 2008. And since it started, we've had uh, uh, 17 graduates from that program, and they were across disciplines within at the master's level, at the graduate level. Um, last year, we started awarding a scholarship, a Wounded Warrior Scholarship, and that was uh, because of the generosity of uh, uh, two families, the Laming family and then the Hartley family. Uh, and because of that, we were, uh, we were able to offer $10,000 scholarships uh, that were renewable for four years. Um, the, uh, uh, um, we awarded two last year, uh, and then we'll award three more this year. And, it's not, and what's, what's unique about these scholarships, it's not just for wounded warriors, it certainly is, but it's also for the primary caregivers who may have to do a complete lifestyle change to support a wounded warrior. Additionally, it's for dependents of wounded warriors that are, are dependents who may have lost their parents overseas. So it's something that uh, we feel we're very proud of being able to offer. Yeah, definitely sounds like a part of KU you can be proud of. Thanks much so much. So. Thank you. Coming up next, we'll take you to Eudora, Kansas, to show you how KU researchers are helping schools statewide try to put an end to bullying. Under Kansas law, all elementary and secondary schools, just like this one here in Eudora, are required to have an anti-bullying policy in place. Recently, KU researchers received a grant to work with these schools, helping to create tailored and successful strategies to put a stop to bullying. What the Kansas State Department of Education um, was looking for was a partner to offer training statewide that would help schools translate this law into something that's effective for their schools. I'm happy that this issue has garnered the kind of national attention because it is a serious problem uh, affecting youth. The downside of that is now it's become, in some instances, I think a catch-all for any kind of a form of aggressive behavior or any kind of conflict that happens to occur among students. And that makes a school's job in determining what's bullying, what's not bullying, where do we then have consequences in place, um, that makes it very difficult to determine, particularly when there are multiple perspectives coming into play. The principal at Eudora Elementary School says they're already seeing positive results from the program. 
Working with KU, we allowed us and our team to come together and look at the procedures that we had in place and make some adjustments. One of the large adjustments that we made was our reporting process, and we turned that reporting process from a paper that got passed from person to person, we turned that into an online reporting form that all members of the team can see immediately and we can share um, conversations with students online um, with each other. I think that's been one of the most wonderful components for me to get to have the privilege to work with Eudora is that the school climate is so anti-bullying and so positive social supports. They've really truly embraced having individuals come into the school to help them out. They don't see it as a oh we're doing something wrong or whatever it's we're doing this right but how can we be better. Our workshops start off with basically Bullying 101. We take the time to go through uh, and open up scenarios to the, to the staff and to the administrators that are attending the workshop to just get a feel for what, what it is that we're talking about. Uh, bullying is, uh, can be very difficult to figure out, is this a bullying incident or isn't it? So uh, just to even start that conversation with, with the attendees, we put up these scenarios and we, and we converse about it. We then take that as an opportunity to, to ex explain what the state law is and how that these scenarios would or wouldn't fit with that state law definition. So we talk a lot about what is cyberbullying, for example, what is relational bullying, and then those traditional physical forms that we, that we tend to know about, but making sure that everybody's clear that we're talking about all those types of behaviors. This is really my first year having to deal with some cyberbullying at the elementary level. I haven't had to deal with that in the past. Really teaching children that if, we, if you wouldn't say it to somebody's face, then we probably shouldn't post it online or on Facebook or where have you. I think one of the, the great things about the workshops has been our ability to go uh, across the entire state. Um, we've had the opportunity to meet educators in basically all four corners of the state and um, see you know, that there are different needs um, as we look at different communities. Um, when we were in more urban settings like the Kansas City or Wichita area, there are more resources available. There, it, for training in particular, it seems like that a lot of the educators who were coming to these workshops um, had received a, a decent amount of training in the past on bullying. As we got further away, it seemed like resources, both in terms of training resources and in anti-bullying um, programs, um, were less available. Having these uh, policies into place in a school changes the overall climate of the school, makes everyone feel safer within the school, makes everyone feel more effective in being able to intervene, and keeps things consistent so that children feel comfortable reporting these things. We will always look to the KU team for some guidance in how we kind of target that area, as well as what um, education do we need to put out for parents. Meanwhile, Georgia, a second grader at Eudora, has some good advice for everyone to live by. You need to be nicer and not try to hurt somebody's feelings because it is the exact opposite of what you should be doing. For more information about KU's work to stop bullying, go to their website at kansansagainstbullying.ku.edu. Up next, KU researchers are working on a revolutionary new treatment for potential arthritis sufferers. Researchers in this KU lab are at the forefront of medical science when it comes to tissue engineering. They're working on better ways to regrow and regenerate cartilage in our bodies, aiming to improve the quality of life for patients with arthritis as well as other medical conditions. The main focus of the research in our lab is to focus on regenerative medicine and tissue engineering. So trying to regenerate tissues that cannot heal otherwise on their own. Short term is you can uh, get on your feet much faster than um, having cost and being have to be in the hospital for long hours. Uh, long term, you wouldn't have to come back, hopefully you wouldn't have to come back multiple times for surgeries, which would save a lot, not just for the person, but also for the hospital and for the insurance companies. So we're looking at a one-time fix. What we're trying to do is help out a patient before they get to the stage of osteoarthritis. So maybe after an initial impact injury, maybe your favorite basketball player for a university or something, uh, after they have that initial impact injury, they would be able to see a physician, orthopedic surgeon, 
who would be able to drill out the injured cartilage and even down into the underlying bone just a little bit so that we'd have a uh, site for the material to anchor and then we'd have a plug that you can press fit into place that helps regenerate bone on the underlying side and then regenerating cartilage on the other side with a seamless transition in between. The cartilage at the end of your bones, they don't have a lot of um, access to nutrients because there's no blood flow to the end of your bones. There isn't a lot of oxygen either, and these cells are very deeply embedded in a really dense matrix, so they're, they're kind of stuck there. And so um, what they, they can't really divide, and it's really hard for them to synthesize new cartilage. I guess one of the areas that our group is interested in is uh, raw materials strategy where we're trying to focus on natural materials to help to regenerate the joint so we put those in our biomaterials, things that the tissue are, tissues are already made of. Combining synthetic and natural materials to create an osteochondral plug so the end product is a small cylinder that you can implant through the cartilage that will actually go into the bone as well and so things that we think the cells like to attach to and can ultimately respond to and differentiate and help produce more cartilage. It is really exciting because before I came in I would have not thought about a one-time fix for arthritis because it's a it's a serious problem and it's just increasing uh, every year so it is exciting because tissue engineering and regenerating an entire organ uh, was theoretical to me until I saw results and oh my god it's actually happening. By working with surgeons as well as business people, basic biologists, other engineers, uh, lawyers for uh, patent you know, intellectual property protection, that's the way that we can really move something from just being an interesting science experiment to a real translational technology that can make a difference in people's lives. This intricate and popular panorama is the centerpiece of KU's Natural History Museum on campus. It's now also the focus of a major renovation. This spring, a team of researchers visited the museum to help create a blueprint on how to preserve this more than 100-year-old treasure. In many ways, the panorama is a work of magic. Imagine the panorama is sitting in Chicago and 20,000 people a day are magically transported from Chicago to the prairie. They're magically transported to the foothills of the Rockies and the bighorn sheep. It was the cutting edge. It was presenting nature in a three-dimensional form that was educational and accessible to a public audience. This is the largest panorama I've ever seen in my life. It is so nationally significant, but it's been cared for by its community. We need to be able to keep what have become our sort of heritage pieces. And certainly the panorama, there's nothing else like it. Ron Harvey and his team from Tucker Brook and Associates will be giving us a comprehensive conservation assessment report. They're going to give us a list of options on how the different injuries that the plants and animals have suffered can be repaired. Everything is old. <laughs> Surfaces that are, you know, over 120 years old, um, you step on moss material, it's gone, it, it's powder. What we're doing in the, in the cleaning is we're removing dust and, and dirt. It's very subtle. We're using dry brushes. We're not using any wet treatments in terms of cleaning. And I think that this ongoing story that the panorama presented in 1893 hasn't changed. All of this material, all of these ecosystems are interwoven and fragile. Students can come here and see the panorama, which is the only one of its type and size in North America. Panoramas and dioramas become a touchstone for people. You get to go back and see, usually generation after generation. Let's keep this unique preservation in place so that future generations can enjoy it. 
from the past to the present and into the future. KU continues to work toward educating minds and improving lives. I'm Jeannie Hodes, and I hope you've enjoyed this journey inside KU.